been here before, the flow of the evening is really easy when we're not having tech issues because uh, <laughs> you're really already doing your part beautifully. Uh, you guys are here, which is what we appreciate. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce our guest, Mike, who just popped in. He'll razzle and dazzle you. And after which we are going to open it up for your questions. As I just said, in this, this session, we're going to have a little bit more time for questions. And if you're new here, um, the, the right at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that Q&A box, which some of you have already jumped into to show your love and support. Um, and that's where you type your questions uh, in the form of a question. Remember you guys, I already know you're smart. We don't need your CV, just jump in with a question. And if you miss any of the talk tonight, uh, it is being recorded. Oh my word, this is being recorded <laughs> and will be available on skepticalinquirer.org. And uh, now uh, our guest is the author of The Storm is Upon Us, How QAnon Became a Movement, Cult, and Conspiracy Theory of Everything. He's a journalist focused on the intersections between um, internet culture and politics as seen through, oh, how do I say, sort of the dark glass of conspiracy theories. Since 2018, he has specialized in examining the QAnon conspiracy cult and is one of the first journalists to reveal the co reveal its connections uh, to past conspiracy theories and scams. His, his expertise led to him becoming like a leading commentator on the subject for various outlets. I mean, like the New York Times, the Washington Post, NPR, CNN, MSNBC, and the BBC. Like this is just to name a few. And so, you know, tech issues aside, we are quite fortunate to have him here to talk with us about QAnon and in particular, how people get caught up in its, its ever broadening web. So please welcome uh, Michael Rothschild. And Michael, I am tickled to say that you have the con. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for putting up with my tech issues. It's 2021, what can I tell you? Um, so QAnon, I am going to assume that everyone on this call knows what QAnon is, has, has at least heard of it. Otherwise, I don't know why you would be here unless you're just a glutton for punishment. But I am not going to assume that everybody knows the finer points of exactly what QAnon is, what it stands for, why people believe it, and why it matters. So I'm going to start there. And then I'm going to read a little bit from my book, which is right here. And then I'm going to take questions because uh, I really like to take questions about this stuff because a lot of people have questions about QAnon, but because QAnon is so different and big and encompasses so many different things, people tend to have a lot of different questions about different aspects of it. So I really like to open that up. But what I'm going to start with is why are we all here? What is QAnon? QAnon is a cult-like conspiracy theory that from October of 2017 until January 20th, 2021, believed that Donald Trump was leading a secret military intelligence team called Q that was using a variety of image boards, first 4chan and then 8chan, to leak cryptic clues to an upcoming purge of the deep state. And by the deep state, I mean the Democratic Party, the banking elite, the Hollywood machine, the uh, behind the scenes intelligence operators who had prevented the Trump administration from accomplishing everything that it wanted to accomplish. Of course, the Jews, it's always gonna be the Jews. Uh, basically anybody who stood against Trump and was part of what, what these people believed was a rising tide of progressivism and godless liberalism that was coming to destroy their way of life and had run a 5,000 year old Babylonian death cult. Q was going to stop it. And the way Q was going to stop it was called the storm. And it was a vast unsealing of hundreds of thousands of secret sealed indictments. And all of these people would be snapped up at once. President Trump would use Twitter to announce, my fellow Americans, the storm is upon us. He would then be spirited away into hiding where his, his minions in the Marines and the National Guard and the Special Forces would grab all these people try them in the field under military tribunal rules and either execute them right there or send them to Guantanamo Bay where then they would be executed. Uh, as you can tell already, QAnon has a lot of extra steps in it. There's a lot of minutia. There are a lot of you know, tangents and rabbit holes that you can go down this. Uh, anything from uh, cures for you know, secret cures for diseases to UFOs 
to JFK Jr. secretly being alive, to child sex trafficking, all of these different things. And, and you could spend an entire hour talking about any one of these things. But I want to talk about just QAnon in general. So I'm going to leave it there for what it was up until January 20th. And as you may know, uh, Donald Trump did not win the election. Q spent a year talking about how Joe Biden could only beat the, the mighty and unstoppable Donald Trump if there was so much fraud and so much chicanery with the election, with the pandemic, with the mailed in ballots, that Joe Biden could not win a freely held election. The only way Biden could win is if he cheated his way to victory. And he won. Therefore, he cheated his way to victory. So QAnon very quickly morphed into a stolen election movement. And right around the time of the election, in fact, election day, the figure most believed to be behind the most recent Q drops on 8Coin, which is the rebranded version of HM. See, it's already getting really complicated. Uh, that guy was Ron Buck. He's probably the guy that you have seen on TV being linked to QAnon. He was the focal point of the recent HBO docuseries, Q Into the Storm. Full disclosure, I was interviewed for it. My interview didn't make the cut. He is the one at the end who all but admits that he was making the Q drops. On election day, he announces on Twitter that he is he has left Aitken. He will no longer be its admin. He's going to devote himself to uh, writing a book about constitutional law, which he knows absolutely nothing about, and woodworking. And I have no idea if he knows anything about woodworking. But he didn't do either of those things. Ron Watkins fashioned himself as an expert in how the election was stolen. So the Q drops stopped, and the Ron Watkins tweets about the stolen election started. And over the next couple of months, it built to this crescendo that Trump was the rightful winner, everything would be exposed. The fraud would come out and Biden would concede the election that he won. Obviously, that didn't happen either. The end result of all of this, not just QAnon, but all of this stolen election conspiracy theorizing was obviously January 6th. Two weeks later, Joe Biden is inaugurated. The storm fizzles out. There, there is no storm. There are no mass arrests. None of it happens. All of it's wrong. And Q has been wrong about pretty much everything from the very beginning. But this is the ultimate disconfirmation. Now, most people would think that people who believe in a movement like this would see the final failure, throw up their hands, realize they've been had, and walk away. Well, I have a feeling we know better. Uh, the people who believed this did not throw up their hands and walk away. Or if they did, they sort of had a little tantrum and they came right back to it. QAnon immediately reinvented itself as a stolen election movement. And that is what it is now. Q, the, the idea of the storm being the mass arrest of the deep state, that literally cannot happen. Unless, of course, Joe Biden is super crafty and arrests himself. Other than that, the storm is not upon us. But what is upon us, what these people believe is going to happen, is that Donald Trump will be restored to the presidency. And that's really the, the prophecy of QAnon right now, that Donald Trump is either still the president somehow still doing presidential things, having a fake cabinet, maybe having a fake aide with a fake nuclear football following him around, or that Joe Biden will resign in shame once the, the crushingness of the fraud is revealed. And that will happen in August, September, whenever this Maricopa County audit is done, whenever the My Pillow guy, Mike Lindell, has his, his cyber symposium. And the truth is so crushing. Biden-Harris will have to resign. Now, in the normal world that we live in, that would make Nancy Pelosi the president. Uh, again, probably not the outcome that these people are, are hoping for. But this is not the world these people live in. The world they live in is one of hope. It is of great things being possible. It is of everything they want, everything they've desired, all of their enemies being destroyed is, is just on the verge of happening. And they have the secret knowledge. They know what's going on. We, the rest of us, do not. First, they had it from the, the codes and the Q drops. Now they have it in the Telegram posts of Lynn Wood and Ron Watkins and a dozen uh, semi-anonymous QAnon groups. Why do they believe this? Why does anybody think after nearly four years of Q predicting 
arrests and upheaval and riots and Trump riding a wave to victory, uh, the Republicans taking the midterms in 2018, gaming out these very specific predictions, none of which came true. Why do people still believe this? So that's what I wanted to get into with the book today. And uh, we're going to read, I'm mean, just going to do a little bit of a reading here from chapter six. Uh, it's called God Wins. That's one of their uh, catchphrases that they use. Q, Q believers believe in a number of what are called thought terminating cliches. Uh, I'm sure all of you've heard that term. These little phrases that absolve them of thinking about what they need to do or thinking that things might not go their way. So this is called God Wins, Why People Believe in QAnon. To any reasonable person, the failure of a long foretold event erodes the belief that it will happen. But belief isn't reasonable. And this stubborn lack of logic isn't limited to people who think the deep state is trying to murder their children. We all have an innate need to believe in good things that are extremely unlikely to take place. It is the essence of hope. Chicago Cubs fans spent an entire century, one generation after another, insisting that maybe they'd win the World Series next year. And every year they were let down until 2016, when they did win the World Series. Most Christians wait for the second coming of Christ, and century after century, Christ does not come again. This is not a sign of lunacy. It's the way belief works. These things give people hope, and a life without hope is hopeless. Even when presented with crushing proof that they've been fooled, they still believe, often taking the proof that they were wrong as proof that they're actually right and are over the target. To do otherwise would be to give in to the hopelessness. This is how it's gone with QAnon's precursors. Even as local governments and law enforcement agencies put out notices warning people that the Iraqi dinar was a scam. This is one of the precursor scams to QAnon that I write about in the book. After numerous dinar brokers were indicted, dinar guru message boards still pumped out Intel updates. In, the, in 2018, the Daily Beast reported on Trump supporters who were making huge dinar purchases based on a cryptic comment from the president that all currencies would be on a level playing field is dealings with China. By the time of the COVID lockdown, Q had been exposed countless times as a fraud and a troll with no connection to military intelligence, whose predictions were the same kind of rapid fire guessing that a strip mall psychic uses, while the movement's members were running into the law for their increasingly violent and untethered behavior. But to the faithful, these were all temporary setbacks perpetrated by a bought and paid for media. Everyone just needed to trust the plan and believe. As Q would say many times, nothing can stop what is coming, nothing. To understand why QAnon followers believe in spite of everything requires understanding why people believe in conspiracy theories in the first place. Human brains need to recognize dangerous situations and we are hardwired to seek patterns, to find order in chaos and to exert control where none can be found. Conspiracy theories at their most basic level assert that we are in danger from hidden forces. This helps give difficult questions and random events satisfying answers and puts, it, puts us at the center of these events. Such beliefs don't begin with the internet, nor are they more prevalent in the internet age. Decades of polling consistently show that over half of Americans believe in some conspiracy theory. And about, that about as many people in, 20, in 1963 believed that multiple assassins killed JFK as they did in 2013. As long as something major and unexpected takes place, there will be people who witness it and struggle to explain it. In, the, in 64 CE, the legendary Roman historian Tacitus wrote of the great fire of Rome, writing up rumors that gangs of thugs kept citizens from fighting the fires and that, and that the corrupt emperor Nero had set the devastating fire himself for his own aims. Conspiracy theories can be held by people who work normal jobs, have loving families, and don't spend every hour of every day soaking in violent ideation. They can take the form of merely irritating our friends with yet another ramble about whatever hidden chicanery we've chosen to believe in. Our cell phone breaking suspiciously just as the service contract expires, so we have to buy a new one, things like that. Sometimes they can even be fun to speculate about, like the viral conspiracy theory about Chuck E. Cheese recycling unused pizza slices to make misshapen new pizzas. Notions that someone is trying to get something over on us go viral for a reason. Many times, someone is trying to get something over on us. Life is full of scams, ripoffs, fraud, small time crooks, cheapskates, and shady types trying to make a buck at our expense. 
to assume that there are many forces out there trying to screw us or hurt us is not delusional. In fact, it might just mean your brain is working the way it should be. As the science writer and podcaster Brian Dunning put it in a 2011 episode of his podcast, Skeptoid, while some conspiracy believers need help, most do not, because there's nothing wrong with them. If you're hearing danger in a strange noise late at night, or looking at a world event and thinking that there must be more to it than what we're being told, you're just doing what your brain has evolved to do as a way to make sense of it. And we all do it, but some of us do it more than others. For much of Q's existence, its stereotypical follower was a white American conservative driven to joylessness by their sense of persecution by liberal elites and obsession with Donald Trump's greatness. In other words, they looked and acted nothing like former QAnon believer Jatar Jadeja. A progressive Australian of Indian descent, Jadeja has a booming easy laugh and considers himself pro-choice, pro-drug legalization, pro-Bernie Sanders, and anti-establishment. He's the antithesis to the demographic that got caught up in an American conspiracy theory that is cheerleading a military takeover of the country after progressives are purged. Yet he got caught up in it. Jadeja spent two years enmeshed in QAnon to the point where he pushed away much of his social circle and found himself increasingly isolated and obsessed with what Q was telling him. Before he got into Q, Jadeja had been baffled by the mainstream media's failure to see Donald Trump's rise coming. So he went searching for alternative explanations for the mainstream media's denial and ignorance. Naturally, he found plenty. First came the conspiracy theory machine, Infowars. And from Alex Jones, he got sucked into Jerome Corsi's breathless decoding of Q drops. In Q, Jadeja found not only better explanations for what was going on, but patriots pushing back against the darkness. As he told me, he found the good guys. His belief in Q, which lasted from late 2017 until well into 2019 wasn't a logical thing. It was hope. I wanted to believe, Jadeja told me over a Zoom call that took weeks to schedule. His story of leaving Q had made him a momentary media sensation as there were virtually no out and proud Q apostates at the time. And his story rang true for many people. I wanted to believe that the good guys were fighting the good fight and in a better future, he said. The story that Q laid out explained so much to him. It explained why the Democratic Party in America that screwed over Bernie Sanders. Hillary Clinton and her cabal did it to stay in power. It explained why the media didn't see Trump's win coming. They were irredeemably corrupt and utterly blind to the people's movement that Trump had created. And it explained Trump's constant failure to deliver on his promises, to lock Hillary up or reform the Federal Reserve or do any of the other anti-establishment things he promised to do. The deep state was thwarting him at every turn or, or else he was failing on purpose in order to expose their evil. Q told him that a secret war was being fought to get rid of all of these horrible people and fulfill Trump's divine promise. It was a war Jadeja wanted to fight. It happened slowly, then all at once. At a low point after failing again to graduate from university and receiving an ADHD diagnosis, Jadeja spent months consuming Q media and interacting with Q believers. He was soon on Reddit and YouTube all the time, watching endless streams of videos and reading the decoding threads of the Q gurus who could make sense of the cryptic messages. Q initially brought him a sense of joy and control, making him feel like he wasn't like everybody else. He wasn't a failure who couldn't move forward, but a warrior whose ADHD gave him an ability to hyper-focus. Q made him an asset, not a screw-up. Q makes you feel important and gives you meaning and self-esteem, he told me, echoing a sentiment that, Q, sentiment that current QAnon believers share on social media all the time. You are saving the world when you're in Q. It's the highest way you can view yourself. And while Q believers immerse themselves in a violent and cynical mythology, they don't see it as an arc or violent. They certainly don't see it as domestic terrorism. They see it as a secret war that must be won. To, to Jadeja, Q believers can only overcome the darkness by thinking they're doing the most important thing that can be done, literally saving the world. Looking back, his ADHD diagnosis and its ripple effects played right into this mindset and had a major role in sending him running to Q. Many Q believers see themselves as weaponizing their lack of social skills, inability to read social cues and repetitive behaviors, all of which are classic symptoms of autism. These autists, as they call themselves, proudly flash their unique abilities by digging deep to solve Q's puzzles. They even explicitly label their skill set weaponized autism, a term that took off on 4chan right around the same time Q did. 
Jadeja began to see himself in the same light with Q's cryptic clues allowing him to use his ADHD, something that the world saw as a crippling handicap for good. He responded by pouring all of his time and effort into Q to the point of shutting everything else out. Bit by bit, Jadeja transformed from an optimistic yet skeptical progressive into a cynical conspiracy obsessive, increasingly unable to talk about anything else other than Q. And he had no, and he had no motivation to stop. Not family, work, hobbies, nothing. Those people he remained connected to were either left in the dark or pulled down with him. While he kept his belief in Q from his extended family and friends, he knew how ridiculous it would sound to them, he did introduce it to his father, with whom he quickly formed a bond over the secret knowledge that they were gathering. That bond became so strong that even after Jadeja left Q behind, his father was still a QAnon believer. Q cuts you off from society and uses that to draw you in and isolate you with like-minded people, he explained to me. People can't leave. There's no, there's no incentive to admit they're wrong. If you admit it to friends in society, people don't look at you the same. People in your life drift away with relationships damaged forever. And you did that, not Q. The hope that fueled his initial belief turned into a type of addiction, an addiction to Q drops, to the discourse, to the special feeling of knowing something other people didn't, and ultimately to that desperate need for something better. But no addiction can be this all encompassing and not be harmful. Jatarth's addiction would drive him to the edge of losing his family and his sanity in a swamp of conspiracies and cynicism. It took him two years and several undeniable disconfirmations that he couldn't explain away, but he eventually got out. While his process of leaving Q and conspiracy theories behind isn't over, he's much further along than other people will meet. And the believers he left behind have no interest in joining him on the outside. So that is just part of the chapter about why, why people believe this. And I get a lot of questions about how could anybody believe this, this nonsense? Why would anybody stick with this? What does it do for people? And I want to explain that it fills holes in their lives. It answers questions. It gives a better explanation for things that need a better explanation. And that could be any number of political events, any number of cultural events, or simply why their life didn't turn out the way they, that they thought it would, and what can they do about it. Q gives you a way to fight back. Most conspiracy theories in you know, books and pamphlets and videos, they're about things being done to you that have already happened. There's nothing that you can do about it. But QAnon is different. QAnon makes you a digital soldier, a secret war between good and evil. And it is an incredibly compelling and powerful feeling. And it's one that people do not want to leave behind. So speaking of answering questions, uh, hopefully difficult questions, uh, I would love to open the floor up. Uh, Leanne, I would love to have you hop back on and we can start uh, We can start taking some questions. All right, I would love to do that. And yes. uh, Mike, thank you so much for that. Um, first and foremost, I love it when uh, folks who have appeared on here uh, show up and they, they are watching. And so I mentioned Stephanie and she was one of the first people uh, yep. to jump on and comment. And I, Stephanie, thank you for watching and also for correcting me. Um, I mistakenly, I was talking about folks, you know, she when she was talking that she had uh, um, gotten out of um, QAnon and I was mistaken. It was 9-11 yep. and Sandy Hook. And in my brain, I conflated it because the, I guess the through line there is people who believe these things, what, yes. whatever that thing might be and how one gets out. So yes. Stephanie, I completely did not mean to uh, misrepresent you, but what you had to say was powerful. And I think um, does apply uh, to whether it's 9-11 or QAnon and all of that. So thank you for hopping on and correcting me. I I appreciate that very much. And, and, and those conspiracy theories are a gateway to QAnon. Uh, one of the things that I really found in writing the book was that QAnon is almost never somebody's first conspiracy theory. Uh, you don't just wake up one day after a lifetime of watching CNN and voting Democratic and, and decide that, you know, Hillary Clinton is an occult priestess and that there's kids being trafficked under Central Park and that uh, Joe Biden is a fake president. That You work into that. <laughs> so people come to QAnon through, yeah, they come to QAnon through 9-11 truth, certainly. Uh, a lot of people came to it through some of the Trump scandals, the Spygate and stuff like that. A lot of people came to it through Obama conspiracy theories, uh, Obama's birth certificate, Obama being elected, 
Some people came to through Trump being elected. They thought that this was finally a person who spoke the things that they were only thinking, who, who thought the same way that the common man did and had the same problems as the common man. Now, yeah, I can see your expression. That's- uh, Sorry, my face does it, things. I apologize. Yeah, no, and, and the thing is, is that no, no one who is actually thinking about this would ever think that. But that's the thing is that these people want this to be true. And so they set aside everything else and just focus on what they need to believe to make this be true. Mm, oh my gosh. Well, uh, I, I just want to add that, that, and I know I asked for questions, but but Stephanie, as a as a, a, a as a, a Skeptical Inquirer presents alum, um, mm -hmm. she just wanted to thank you uh, for your accessibility and your kindness and your support on I Twitter. Haven't. You know, she's yes. she's very um, appreciative of that. Um, let's see. Oh, we've got oh tons and tons and tons right. of uh, questions here. Um, and I know that we're also ag trying to aggregate some in the background, but here's a very basic one. And I, and I think it's easy to want to believe this. So I'll put it out there. Uh, Joel has asked, are QAnon people poorly educated? I, I think we want to think that. <laughs> I think we do want to think that. And, and mostly they're not. Um, Q is, is not the, the home of sort of poor and uneducated yokels living in their trailers. There are a lot of people who have college degrees, who, who own businesses, who have really achieved a lot, who believe this. There are people who, who really should know better, who believe this. And, and you know, in terms of education, I think, I think a lot of people who believe this have education and somehow it gets tamped down. Their, their instinct to question this and their instinct to push back against it is drowned out by the, the need to believe it and the desire for it to be real. And of course, we are all susceptible to that. Every single one of us yeah. can put aside the voice in our head telling us that something is not true, something is a bad idea, don't do that, because we want to do it. We think it's true. We want it to be true. So no, Q believers by and large are not poorly educated. I, I think that that ties into something and that both you and Stephanie have talked about and in what you just mentioned uh, a, a few comments before, that perhaps their logic is being overridden by feeling and that feeling that they get that they're important, that they're yes. doing something, that they're in on it. That's, yes. that's seductive stuff. Oh yeah. You know? Oh yeah. That, that's um, secret that's knowledge that I know something you don't. That's hugely compelling. And that's one of the biggest reasons that people stay in QAnon. It is the feeling of being special with a group of people who are also special and a community around you that validates the things that you believe and doesn't think you're crazy, doesn't think you're stupid. You think the people who don't believe it are crazy. And that, that glue holds these people not just into Q, but holds them to each other. You know, I don't mean to be flippant, but you know, maybe all of this could have avoided, been avoided if more people played Dungeons and Dragons. I you know, think so. That, that doesn't yeah, seem no, so outrageous I, I, right now. <laughs> yeah, no, if more people uh, went looking for something in their life and did not go to a Facebook group to find people who were angry at the same people that they were. Yeah, 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 the anger is just, woof. Yeah. oh my gosh. Um, Richard asks a very good question. Uh, where did the name QAnon, this is a very basic, but I want to mm -hmm. know too, where did the name QAnon come from? Sure, that's actually a great question. And it actually really ties into a lot of where the movement is now. They do not use that term anymore. Uh, they, there was a late Q drop that basically memory hold all of the QAnon iconography by saying, there is Q, there are Anons, there is no QAnon. So I'll, and I'll explain those terms in a second, but what they were basically saying is that this term that we've been using on ourselves, we've never used this. We don't, we don't oh. say this. The media okay. made that up to make us look crazy and do, I, and do tar us for their false flags and their hit pieces. So, but the, the etymology of the term has, there's two different parts of it. So Q is from what the poster on 4chan called themselves. They called themselves Q clearance patriot. Uh, now, Q clearance is a real thing. It's a Department of Energy term that means you have access to classified information regarding the nuclear arsenal. And there's a couple of different people who've used that term, not in the Department of Energy sense, but as a sort of grand clearance for military secrets. You see it in the, the, the really important book from 1991, Behold a Pale Horse. Uh, the conspiracy theorist William Cooper uses it. 
to say that he had Q clearance and was dialed into some of the biggest government secrets. Well, he wasn't. Uh, there, it was also thrown around in an episode of the show Archer, where uh, somebody claimed they had top secret Q clearance. Now, Q pulls a lot of their mythology from pop culture. So it is entirely possible that this idea came from Behold a Pale Horse, Archer, or somewhere else. Nobody really knows. Okay. And so at some point, Q identified themselves as Q Clearance Patriot. Now, there were already a series of these anonymous, whistleblowing, truth-telling accounts on 4chan that also called themselves Anons. So there was a White House insider Anon who claimed to be a, uh, an Obama White House insider. They weren't. There was FBI Anon, uh, same thing. There was, uh, I think there was a CIA Anon. There was an MI5 Anon for you know, spilling the secrets of British intelligence. So this Anon was, was named that actually by a 4chan user in Canada, ironically, uh, because they had been called, they were being called a couple of different names. They were being called Info, Info Dump Anon. Uh, not a really a name you really want to brand yourself with. Not, nothing with the word dump in it. Um, they were also being called LARPer. <laughs> they were being called LARPer guy, a LARP standing for live action role playing. So somebody called, started calling them Q Anon, and the term stuck. Uh, okay. Until then, they decided it didn't exist. Wow. So very complicated okay. answer to a very simple question. No, no, that's really cool. No, folks even want that that in depth stuff. Awesome. And and and, and, and to just I'll throw this in here. None of this is to be confused with Al Anon. That's no. a whole no, no. different no. thing. No. No. Different show. No. Um now is is Gerald wants to know so is Q still making his drops? Which no. sounds like a DJ dropping rhymes, but yeah, you know, it's nothing <laughs> that no, I wish it was. There has not been a new Q drop since December of 2020. And um, now Q has, has stopped posting for, for times before. There'll be, there would be a week that would go by with no Q drops, 10 days, two weeks. For about three months in the summer of 2019, there were no drops because um, HN lost its web security after its, uh, its DDoS protection was pulled because it was starting to become the home for mass shooter manifestos. Uh, the owner of 8chan, this guy, Ron Watkins, he's this dude you've, you've maybe seen in the documentary. He's got the weird mustache and he talks in a very creepy way. He reconstituted 8chan as 8coin. He said it was going to be completely different. It wouldn't allow that stuff anymore. It's exactly the same. It allows all of that same stuff. Uh, I would advise no one to go to these places, uh, 4chan or 8coin. They're just, they're, they're just awful, awful places. Extremely difficult to navigate. There's nothing there you want to find. So uh, Q was down for about three months. So you're thinking, if this is a plan to save the world, if this is a plan to rescue hundreds of thousands of children from trafficking rings, why is it taking three months off? Is it like taking the summer holiday? I mean, who knows? But the last Q drops were uh, December of 2020. So, and this is, this is actually great. I love this. The last ever Q drop is a, is a YouTube video that links to a Trump campaign rally, uh, like a minute and a half supercut of Trump saying stuff at a campaign rally with the Twisted Sister song, We're Not Gonna Take It, except the copyright on the song got pulled. So the last ever Q drop is a dead link. I love it. It's perfect. So oh there have been God. no Q drops since then. And I really don't think there, there will be any more. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Although, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. So somebody yes, it might sure step does. in. Yes, it sure does. Know. And I, I got to say, the 80s baby in me loves the we're not going to take it. <laughs> um, I don't I don't think there's an answer to this question, um, Richard Gross, but what percentage of the country are members of or believe in QAnon? The New Yorker in me wants to say all the red states, but that's not fair. It's it, well, and there isn't an answer. This is very, very right. difficult to quantify. There, there is polling on it. Um, some of it I read about in the book, and there's been some other polls that have come out since then. The numbers on this are all over the place. You're getting like seven yeah. percent of Republicans. You're getting thirty percent of Republicans. There's one poll that twenty five percent of evangelical Protestants believe in QAnon by name. The problem is that a lot of people believe in the mythology of QAnon the deep state, the trafficking rings, COVID being a hoax, the stolen election, but don't either know what QAnon is or actively will say, I'm not one of those crazy Q people. 
You know, I don't, don't, don't call me that. I'm not that. Um, I would say that it is very difficult to quantify this, but I think the thing we want to, to uh, remember is that this is not a red state phenomenon. There are a whole lot of QAnon believers in Southern California where I live. There are a lot of QAnon believers in Manhattan. There are a, an outsized number of QAnon influencers from New Jersey. I don't well, know it's why. Jersey, come on. It, it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, there's major QAnon influencers in what we think of as cities, blue states, blue areas, progressive areas. Um, they, they're they sort of all over the place and they're very quiet about QAnon now because they don't use the terminology anymore. They're, they just now show up to city council meetings and school board meetings screaming about um, masks giving you uh, pneumonia and the COVID vaccine having microchips and Joe Biden being a fake president uh, working on a set in Tyler Perry's house. It's all things they think. Uh, yes, that's the new one. So it is... It is very, very difficult to say, but it's probably way more than we think. Yeah, listen, I don't know, man. I, I'm happy with my microchip. Um, <laughs> it's 5G. My credit score went up. It's, sure. just, it's been good. Sure. It's been Great good. Wi-Fi everywhere you go. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. Absolutely. Dude, yeah. get the chip. Um, get the chip. Here's my question for you. Well, not my question, but Aaron wants to know, um, is QAnon going to become more dangerous or peter out? I know what I'd like it to do. Well, yeah. And I think um, it's the answer is sort of all of those things. The QAnon that we have understood is, is, is petering out. The idea of the, you know, the traffic rings and the storm and where we go, when we go all, that stuff really is starting to peter out. The problem yeah. is it is becoming more mainstream. And as it yes. becomes more mainstream, it becomes less fringe. And it becomes more vanilla. It becomes more palatable to, to mainstream conservatives who maybe don't want to read about Hillary Clinton doing occult rituals or don't want to sift through 150 tweet thread uh, trying to decipher what Trump's Twitter typos mean. A lot of people don't want to do that and, and really do think that's crazy. Mm -hmm. They also think the election was stolen and that vaccines are, are poison. So the mythology of QAnon is becoming more mainstream. It is becoming more acceptable in Republican circles, even as the QAnon that we have been tracking and writing about is starting to fall by the wayside. And in terms of danger, I think the danger is the same and is very high. We've seen crimes committed by QAnon believers going back to 2018. I, I really started seeing some of this stuff in that summer when you had the Hoover Dam incident. This is, I read about this quite a bit in the book. This, um, this former Marine named Matthew Wright thought that Donald Trump was holding a secret inspector general report that would blow the lid off of the intelligence community, uh, hampering him and running a parallel government to his. So this guy, Matthew Wright, gets in his homemade armored truck, which he was also living in at the time, grabs two guns, 900 rounds of ammunition, flashbang grenades, drives to the bridge outside Hoover Dam, barricades himself in his car and starts live streaming his pleas to Donald Trump to release the inspector general report. Even held, a, held up a paper sign saying hashtag release the OIG report. The idea of a secret unredacted OIG report is straight from a Q drop. Nobody else thought that, nobody else came up with that. That is straight from a Q drop. So this guy, after barricading himself, sending tourists fleeing for their lives, takes police on a chase off-road. They finally shoot his tires out. He, I think he runs it, he ran his car into a tree. He was arrested. He's now in prison. And he got an eight-year sentence for domestic terrorism um, because of, he believed what AQ drop said. And this was summer 2018. This was when most people still thought that this was just a joke and that this was just some crazy internet stuff. Since then, we've seen murders, we've seen vandalism, we've seen child kidnappings, we've seen uh, buildings being shot up, we've seen got Q believers with guns trying to show up to vote counting facilities. And that was all before January 6th. And of course, uh -huh. that is a completely different right. ball of wax. Now you have millions of people who believe some version of 
Joe Biden is not really the president and Donald Trump will be restored to office. That's not going to happen. And when that doesn't happen, I think most of these people will probably fall away and find some other conspiracy theory to believe in and, and really wouldn't commit violence. I think most of these people are nonviolent, but all of them believe in a mythology that is violent at its core. So the potential for large scale domestic terrorism, I think, is, is higher than ever with QAnon, even as they don't use the term QAnon. Anymore. So I wish I had a better answer. Um, unfortunately, we, we just really need to watch out. We, we need to be vigilant with these people. Wow. Well, okay. Now, okay. So speaking of being vigilant, we have, I have a couple of questions here, especially since you mentioned the name of the former president, yes. you know, does he, does he now that he's out say anything about QAnon? Does he acknowledge it? Is he, you know, he hasn't, as far as I know, in any of his, um, statements, not that I'm really even paying attention to them much anymore, right, yeah, although yeah. I really think we have to, uh, unfortunately. But of course, while he was president, he talked about it a couple of times. He started retweeting QAnon believers two weeks after the first Q drops. Um, and I, this is another thing I get into in the book. There's this Twitter account, I think it's still up, called Magapill. And this account tweeted the pres Donald Trump presidential accomplishment list in November of 2017. Trump, of course, was like, I, I love this. You know, this isn't even the half of it. And retweeted this whole thing. This guy, Magapin, or girl, we don't know, was also an early Q believer and wrote a very long blog post about how the storm was coming. And here's this military intelligence leaker who's revealing all of these secrets. And this is amazing. Now, Magapil eventually turned against QAnon thought the whole thing was just a, a Republican psyop to make uh, conservatives uh, just complacent, deleted their blog post. Of course, you can still find it. But this was the first of over 300 times Donald Trump retweeted QAnon believers. And of course, then he was asked about it. And this took years to happen. And it was it was like going to be a huge thing in the media, in the Q world. You know, when is Trump going to be asked about QAnon? Because they somehow thought that Trump would reveal the secrets of what this was all of the time. And then somehow Q would just end at that point. And, and these Q believers are like, why doesn't he end it unless it's real? So he gets asked about it. And of course he's like, well, I don't know much about it, but I know they fight pedophiles and they love me. And I, I think that's great. So this was like the greatest moment of these people's lives. Right. Uh, now, Q, now Trump has never uh, specifically said anything of, of value about Q. He's never really said whether it's real or not. I have no idea if he thinks it's real or not at all. I mean, I don't, I try not to psychoanalyze Donald Trump, but he clearly had people around him who knew what it was. They fed him the stuff that he could retweet that would, that would make these people happy and, and get them buzzing and get them supporting him. So whether or not he was sort of trolling around 4chan in the middle of the night, I don't think he was. He's, he's pretty tech illiterate, but he had people on his team who knew what this was and he really enjoyed getting this stuff out there and riling up liberals and affirming his base's worship for him. <laughs> this is so exhausting. Yes, it is. Yes, it sure is. Wow, I appreciate you doing this work. To, I mean, you, I mean you, you, you know, I, I, I really do appreciate your answers. Um, I have a couple of questions here and that, that sort of feed into each other. Mm -hmm. um, one well, talked about how once these people are in, they, they don't listen to anything. They don't take in any additional information. And I'm gonna sort of gonna, and then, and then what do you do about that? But I'm gonna combine that with something that Chad has asked that uh, he's seen intelligent people Intelligent people will still come to these conspiracies. What kind of red flags uh, do you look for maybe ahead of time before they're completely down the rabbit hole uh, to point them out and, and trying to make them see reason before they get to the point mm. of where they're walling themselves off and they're in the bunker? And yeah, that's no a great question. This, this, this idea of sort of preventive care of people yeah. who, are, who are getting sucked into this, I think is really important. It really varies on the person. With some of the Q crimes, these people didn't have social media footprints they weren't on the radar of anybody. They just kind of did these things because they were hearing voices or were mentally incompetent. A couple of the Q murders have actually been committed by people who could not stand trial because of mental issues. But generally speaking, when you find somebody who gets sucked into Q, most of the time they won't shut up about it. 
They have the zeal of a new convert. Uh, mm -hmm. it, is there, it is all over their social media. It will probably be the only thing they want to talk about. And they will talk about it in a lot of different ways. And they'll talk about, now they'll talk about vaccines. They'll talk about masks. They'll talk about COVID in general being a hoax or fake, or they don't want to get the vaccine. You know, if you got it, why do I need it? They're going to talk about Joe Biden not being the real president. Maybe they don't think Trump is going to be reinstated, but they think that Biden only won because of voter fraud and that, you know, we need to really count all the votes. They're going to say certain things. Okay. And they're going to start relying on certain media outlets. So you're going to see Infowars. You're going to see Breitbart. You're going to see um, these big figures in right-wing media who have been pushing this stuff. You're going to see them start talking about Telegram more, the secure messaging app where most of the big Q and conspiracy theory gurus have gone now. Basically, they're, they're, most of the time, they're not going to hide it they're, because they want, they, they, they want to evangelize. They want to extol this amazing thing that they found. It's like when you really get into a niche TV show and it's all you want to talk about. This is just sort like, of a, a Like Star Trek? Or, or like even something like really <laughs> obscure. Like yeah, they like, red dwarf. Like they found, yeah, like you found like some obscure TV show that people don't really know about. It's all you want to talk about. This is just a more toxic version of that. So okay. they're, they're going to start sort of broadcasting it. And that is a point where you can step in very quickly and say, hey, do you know what this is about? You know, I'm not sure where you're getting your information from. You're not trying to make it confrontational. You're not trying to fact check your way out of it. You're not trying to debate them. That, that will be a huge waste of time. You're not trying to mm -hmm. debunk it because they're, they're not open to hearing it. You certainly okay. don't want to start mocking them or belittling them because mm. chances are they're just going to go deeper into this thing that they found. But if you ask them questions about it and, and really sort of present yourself as a, as a curious person and a safe harbor, and, and maybe you find some really good information about it, and you're able to sort of gently push back at times, but not in a way that picks a fight. Because that's right. what they want. They want to fight. Oh, yeah. You don't want to oh, yeah. fight. Don't fight. You can't win. There's no winning. And if, they, if they're not willing to listen, if, if you start to feel harassed, if you start to feel unsafe, you are well within your rights to, to walk away from that person. There is absolutely no requirement to have a QAnon believer or conspiracy theorist in general in your life. You don't have to save that person. But if, mm -hmm. if you do want to, and if you do feel like maybe there's a chance of getting through, there are things that you can do, but it's very difficult because this stuff, as we've been talking about, is very alluring. And it really answers a lot of questions that you are not going to be able to answer, mostly because the questions are meaningless, but the questions have meaning to them. Right. I, I want to remind folks um, that this, you are very much paralleling what a former guest, uh, Mick West, mm, talked yes. about, you know, that we are not going to win these yeah. in logic in a five minute conversation and go, yeah. ha ha, and yeah. the person has changed. Yep. You know, it's, it really yeah. is listening. It really is compassion. It really is time that you may or may not want to invest, you yeah. know, and, and, you know, automatically jumping to fights, which skeptics are on occasion very good at, um, is not going to, it's not the win for us here no no um, it's not at all no. um, I know we're getting really close to the end and I don't know if you can answer this quickly but I realized yeah. we, we have some assumptions here and we assumed everybody was familiar with the terms but Richard has reminded us uh not so much what are Q drops sure that's no it's a perfect question a Q drop is uh, is a message from Q they're all posted on either 4chan or 8chan there are about 4900 of them uh, you can actually find them online. Uh, you can go to, there's a couple of aggregate sites that are still available. Um, but they are basically cryptic messages. Some of them are just links to tweets or Fox News stories. Some of them are really long strings of rhetorical questions. Some of them are uh, pictures. Some of them are memes. Some of them are like just lists of like Rothschild central banks, uh, not my family. Not a thing, not part of the Rothschild banking family, but that's a great question. Q drops are basically the holy scripture of the Q movement, which is a terrifying concept. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Oh my goodness. Um, I, I don't know if there's a short answer to this, but a bunch of questions are trending on whether does QAnon have funding? Uh, how is mm. it so successful if it was truly regular people posting anonymously? Yeah. Those and are really two separate things, but. Yeah, yeah. And, and this thing, I think they're weird. there's always a, a, a sense to want to follow the money. There really yes. is no money here. Now there's money in some of the, some of the, some of the activism and there's certainly money yes. in the merchandise, 
Yes. But, but Q is a belief. Q is a way of looking at the world. Other than the money used to keep 8chan up and running, which is not much. I mean, it's a pretty janky website. There's really no, there's no one sort of trickling money down. Like you're not going to find the Koch brothers funding this. This is a okay. people's movement. And now you can you can find money in a lot of different places, but the, the belief itself doesn't require any funding. It just requires belief. Um, I'm gonna, the, we could honestly do this for a whole other hour. Yes. So, and, and we left extra time and we still have a ton of questions, yeah. but I, I wanna try to wrap up with this one. Um, how do you stay sane researching this? Because yeah. I'm, I'm exhausted. When I get off of this, I'm going to go sit on my couch with a very strong adult beverage <laughs> that is, and find that something is the on right Netflix call. that's restorative. That's the right call. Well, that's okay. what I do. I, I log off. Um, okay. This, I, okay. I, consider this, I consider this work. This is a job. Um, I, I'm not trying to save the world. I don't consider myself an activist. I consider myself a chronicler of this. And okay. I, you know, I do my work. I write. I research. I talk to people. But then when it's done, I log off. Like I'm not okay. doing this 24 seven. I can't, nobody, nobody should do that. So okay. I, you know, I've got my family, I've got hobbies. Uh, I've got stuff that has absolutely nothing at all to do with this world. When I'm in it, I'm that. working. And okay. yeah, and when I'm not, I, I try not to pay attention. Anything important will be there the next day. That is a beautiful final quote, sir. Mm -hmm. Did you hear that, my skeptical people? Take some time off. <laughs> yes, log, log off, go outside. Log off. Oh my goodness, Mike, thank you so much thank, uh, for yeah. your time. Yeah. Um, and I wanna just remind everybody um, that this is being recorded. If you missed anything or you wanna go back and it will be available uh, tomorrow at skepticalinquire.org. And I wanna remind you to please join us for the next Skeptical Inquirer Presents on Thursday, August 19th. Guy Harrison will be chatting mm -hmm. with us uh, about about the, uh, the captivating power of reality. So again, Mike, thanks again sure. uh, for your time. And my thanks to Skeptical Inquirer, the Center for Inquiry, uh, our awesome producer, Mark Kreidler, who was working magic in the background. And my biggest thanks, uh, most of all, is to you, the audience. My name is Leanne Lord. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thank you Good night, much. Mike. Good Enjoy. Night.